If you have your Bibles with you this morning, we'd ask you to turn to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 5. And while you're turning there, we again remind you to pray for Brother Downs who think to do it. Uh, haven't heard anything this morning, but continue to pray for him. Genesis chapter 5, and we're going to begin reading in verse 18. Genesis chapter 5. Beginning in verse 18, the Bible says, And Jared lived, uh, and Jared lived 160 and two years, and he begat Enoch. And Jared lived after he begat Enoch 800 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Jared were 960 and two years, and he died. And Enoch, lived six, uh, and Enoch lived sixty and five years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah three hundred years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were three hundred sixty and, and five years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your goodness and your watch care. Lord, we thank you for each and every one that is here this morning. We praise you for that. Lord, we know and understand that they're not here by chance, but rather by design of you. Lord, we pray this morning that you would open your word uh, to our hearts and minds, Lord, that we have an understanding, Lord, that you fill this place with your presence, with your spirit, and that you make your word a living word to us this morning. We ask these things in the sweet and the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Now, uh, fairly familiar verses of Scripture, and uh, we'll be preaching this morning, the Lord being our helper, about walking with the Lord. Now, um, it is not a natural desire of mankind to walk with the Lord. In fact, our natural desire is to run from Him. And if the Lord don't intervene, that's how you spend your life is running in the opposite direction because in the natural state, the flesh, um, we have no interest in God and, and we really have an aversion to God if he doesn't change us. And, and so we find uh, a very unusual case in all the patriarchs and that is where Enoch doesn't taste death. Now, as a natural man, we can't imagine that uh, an individual that didn't have to die, an individual that did not face death. Uh, I, I've worked in healthcare all my life. I can't even imagine how many people I have seen draw their last breath, and I've seen time and time again people simply die. But we read of a man uh, by the grace of God, and we read a man by the power of God that that doesn't happen to. And that's, a, that's an amazing thing, and it's a, a, a life that is noteworthy uh, simply because he didn't. Now, in, again, in verse 18, and Jared lived 160 and two years, and he begat Enoch. Now, as you go down any of these uh, genealogies uh, in the Bible, and the Bible's full of them, and a lot of times we run through them without thinking. And, and you know, we get bored with it, and sometimes we say, well, there's nothing to that. Well, uh, there's always something to the Word of God. It's not put in there by happenstance. And in the genealogies of nothing else, it comes to this, God created man. And God created man for his own purpose. And God created man to honor him. And so we find then that what would uh, ordinarily be just routine stuff, uh, a man in the middle that's a very unusual character, a very unusual individual. So his dad being Jared, uh, he was born in verse 19, and Jared lived after he begat Enoch 800 uh 800 years and begat sons and daughters, and all the days of Jared were 960 and two years, and he died. Now, all my life, I've been, you know, everybody's been asked, well, uh, were these regular years? Yes. Now, you say, well, how could a man live uh, 900 years old? Well, by the hand of God, 
you'll live just as exactly like how long he wants you to live. Right. And uh, there are some truth, there are some things I can see prior to the Noah, the Noah flood. There was a different atmosphere than we have today. And they probably did age a little bit slower uh, than we do. But the, the sum of the matter is this. Life was precious and he gave it to them. And he gave them many, many, many years. Uh, but we'll find in all these long life, and they were good people, no doubt, there was only one man that it's ever said of that he walked with God. Now, I've known some pretty old people. Uh, the oldest person I ever met was 110. And, you know, that's a long, long, long time to live. He was a black gentleman, and I was young, and, and, and his parents were freed slaves. And, and, and so we, uh, we see that that is some incredible things that he could tell. And what I learned from that is this, is why uh, life should get from God. And it should be used for God. It's not for your pleasure and for what you want to do with it. It's a gift of God. And, and so we find the reason that these men live so long is because that's the way that God wanted them to be. And secondly, it was their purpose to honor God. And so we find that uh, Jared is the second longest person to ever live. Now the Bible says this concerning long life. The Bible says this, Honor thy father and thy mother that it may be well with thee and that thy days may be long upon the earth. And, and so you want, a, you want a long life, you take care of mother and dad. You, you want a long life, don't re disrespect them. Don't look in their face and jeer and mar. Because you know what? You'll have a very short life. Yeah, you, you know, uh, I was talking about Brother Downs earlier and, and how that one of the things that in, in the States we would almost see as a complication but I think it's a good thing. Thailand don't have nursing homes. And the reason why they step up to the plate and they take on the responsibility and say, I'll care for my parents. And, and so now we find uh, an American dying in that culture. It's almost strange for us to think there not be a nursing home. But you know why they, why they came to be? Uh, children not stepping up to the mark. That, 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 that's what it's about. And so we find then that uh, uh, this second oldest man must have taken care of, must have uh, honored his mother and his daddy in some way just because of the life that he led. Then it said, And Enoch lived sixty and five years and begat Methuselah. Now, it is very noteworthy because all of you know who Methuselah was. He is the longest man that ever lived. 969, he beat his granddaddy by seven years. And, and so, in between Methuselah and his uh, granddaddy, we have the shortest life that, uh, that we'll find of any of the patriarchs. Just 365 years. Now, we'll find there's a great reason by that, and I don't believe uh, that Enoch didn't honor his daddy. I don't believe Enoch was, uh, was mean to his parents. I don't think Enoch was an individual that avoided saying anything to his mother and daddy, but he learned to prioritize, and his priority was to serve God. Now, the question is, what's your priority? You know, um, I, I say for the majority of the people today, the priority is making a dollar. The priority is smooth sailing while we're here. Well, you know, this is a very short time when you begin to compare it to eternity. Yeah. So money doesn't mean a whole lot when you think, huh, when you think you get to the other side. And, 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 you know, money's not much anyway. Uh, when I've been to other countries, you know, uh, I don't know, I've got a $10 bill this morning, that's all I have. That means nothing in other countries. You know what that is in another country? A green piece of paper, nothing more, nothing less. You, you won't get to go buy a gallon of milk with that in Thailand. 
It doesn't mean anything to them. And, and, and so we find then what often seemingly means the most to us has no eternal value at all. And, and so in the middle of these very aged men, we find a relatively young man. And the reason why becomes very clear. And Enoch walked with God, verse 22, and Enoch walked with God after he got, begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years. And Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. Now, this week for your private study, you can do this. And you can go down through these genealogies all the way from, uh, from Adam and Seth all the way down to the end. And nothing is said significantly about their lives except the birth of one child. And in, in the middle of this genealogy, we find a man that what was noteworthy about him, the only one that really gets more than three verses is this, is that he walked with God. So when, when this life is over, does anything else really matter except that if you walk with God or not? And, and you know, I have to say that, and, and we'll look at it in a minute a little bit more closely, to walk with God, you've got to give other things up. You know, I've thought about that uh, over the years. Me and Donna's been married a little over 31 years now. And until so Adam came along, and, you know, uh, uh, we would walk holding hands and everything, you know. And, and it was sweet. And then Adam came, and I put him on this hip and hold hands with this hip. And then Matthew came, and we quit holding hands because she had one to carry and I had one to carry. And they became the priority. You see what I'm saying? Uh, those the, the, they, they required care. They required supervision. And it's not because I didn't want to hold hands with Donna. It was because things became a different priority. Right? Mm -hmm. And when we get right with the Lord, we can turn a lot, a lot of loose that we thought was priority. Uh, yeah. You see what I'm saying? Uh, that we thought we had to have. That, that we thought was necess a necessity for life. And, and, and so we find then that this very unusual man called Enoch, that, that's kind of in there in the middle of all this other, that uh, his difference simply was this, is that he walked, uh, that he walked with God. He, he knew God differently. He knew God in a special way. Now, I want you to just for a very brief moment, draw it down to Genesis chapter 6, verses 8 and 9. And everybody knows Genesis 6, 8 is my favorite verse. But I want you to give you something noteworthy in verse 9. The Bible says in Genesis uh, 6, 8, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, I want you to see, just like Enoch, there's nothing noteworthy different than, than any of those other patriarchs except that this, he found grace. You, you, you know what, be, what be, makes you to begin to think about eternity is grace. Mm -hmm. Because it is not in man's natural thoughts to consider their soul. It is in not in man's natural way to consider eternity. And it's certainly not in man's natural way that God is above me. He controls all things because you know what? I want to be in control. I want to be the director of my life. I want to do what I want to do. And seeking God don't figure into that, right? So the only difference is Noah found grace, right? Yeah, and, and you all know what grace is, right? Grace is the unmerited favor of God. Right. Not that you deserved it, not that you asked for it, simply because of his own goodness, he did it. Right. 
So we find, we find in this genealogy uh, another thing, another man, that, and that is Noah that had this experience of grace. Verse 9. Uh, there are, these are the generations of Noah. Uh, Noah was a just man and, a per, and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Now, we, we find the very, the very same thing, the very same statement, and, and if you're keeping up with generations, Noah would be Enoch's great-grandson, and, and we find this, they are the only two men in your King James Bible that it is ever stated, Enoch and Noah, that they walked with God. So that's very noteworthy. And I think probably the most noteworthy thing about it is this. It brought deliverance to both of them. Right? It brought deliverance to Enoch. Enoch did not face death like you and I will face death should the Lord not return before our lives are uh, or ex uh, exhausted. And Noah was excused from the flood. Now, um, he did he did die naturally eventually, but see, everybody in the land, everybody on the earth except his wife and his three sons and his son's wives, uh, uh, they were the only ones delivered, and they were delivered on the grace of God. And you know what? This was the other thing. Noah believed God. When he said, Noah, it's going to rain, he didn't say, God, what is rain? And he could have because it never rained before. In other words, he was accepting a concept he had never heard of because God said so. And, and, and see, when we begin to think the miraculous things, you know what? I, I've never seen anybody just taken away like, uh, uh, like Enoch was, but I believe it because God said it. So when Noah got this message and said, listen, uh, God said, listen, it's going to rain, and I want you to build a big boat so you and your family will be preserved, he the Bible says this, that he moved with fear. You know, uh, that, that's not a natural habitat for man is to believe God to the point that you move on. And that's exactly what, that's exactly what Noah did. And I really think that, that in reality is exactly what Enoch did. Now, so we, we find then, uh, if, if we want to stand out, if, if we want that closeness to the Lord Jesus Christ, we're going to have to walk with him. We're going to have to listen to him above what the world has to say. We're going to have to take this book as the literal word of God. You know, uh, I, I get so tired of people trying to spiritualize this book from cover to cover. You know, you know when it speaks in parables? When it says so. And, and you know when it's not a parable? the rest of the time, right? And, and, and so we find here uh, what we have to do is just like Enoch and Noah is simply believe what the Word of God has to say. Get on the move. Begin what you must do. Now, I want to go over to 2 Kings, and we're going to talk about this walk because your average preacher today will make you think it's like roses and will make you think it's all going to be smooth sailing and everything's just going to be fine. But I'm here to tell you this morning, it might be a disappointing message to you. Listen, if you want to walk with God, you've got a tough road to hope. And we're going to find that just in a minute. Uh, those of you that are saved, I ask you, has it all been, has it always been just great? And, you know, everything's gone uh, just like you thought it would go? Of course not. There's hardships along the way. There's difficulties along the way. And there's problems along the way. And, unfortunately, that's the nature that this life brings. You know, uh, you know why a lot of people quit going to church? 
is people, uh, and probably well-meaning men, tell you if you just accept the Lord Jesus, everything's going to be fine. Well, you know what? I've not found that to be the truth. Have you? Ask Paul. Do you think he accepted the Lord Jesus, whatever that means? And uh, was it smooth sailing for Paul? Was it smooth sailing for John the Baptist? Was it sm smooth sailing for Peter? Certainly not, was it? What about the Philippian jailer? Was it smooth for him? No, it wasn't. And, and, and so when people hear that and then the reality sets in, what they think, hey, it must not be true anyway, I'm done. And they're gone. And, and, and so we find then, here in the Word of God, a, uh, a situation where one, one young prophet learns from an older man. 2 Kings chapter 2 in uh, the very first verse, 2 Kings chapter 2, in the very first verse, and it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Now, uh, we find some fairly familiar verses of Scripture, the catching away of Elijah, and notice it is very uh, similar in the catching away of Enoch, but the only difference, the best we know, no one saw Enoch go. Uh, nobody, nobody, he just went, and uh, I don't know if they looked about him and made out a, a missing persons report on him or what, because there's, no, there's nothing that says anybody seen that, e that Enoch went. Uh, all we know is they saw something in his life before that said Enoch is walking with God. Uh, the priority is his relationship with him. You know, uh, uh, we need to have that as our primary relationship, is our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ or the, the Godhead, however you want to look at that. Uh, me and Donna... Uh, count the time we saw each other soon be 33 years and just as fresh as it was then however God's got to be more special God's got to be more intricate even the relationship that I have with my wife because sometimes that's a compromising relationship if you, if you don't if you don't think that that's true remember Lot's wife Right? They love, I'm sure Lot loved his wife, and I'm sure Mrs. Lot loved him. I don't know. But you know what? What was really most important to Lot's wife was what was going on in this present evil world, and she looked back, which means she didn't trust her husband. Right? And, and, and so sometimes it will be even to the point you're going to say, okay, you know, Donna, if that's what you want to do, go ahead and do it, but I'm going to serve the Lord. That, that's going to be my thing to do. And, and so I believe certainly that Enoch was this kind of man because he had a wonderful reputation. He had a wonderful testimony, and that was that he walked with God. So again, in 2 Kings uh, chapter 2, Elisha makes the decision to leave Gilgal and go to Bethel. Now, in serving, the God, in serving God, very frequently he's going to take you out of that, that little plane that you say, okay, this is the whole world to me, and he'll take you somewhere else. You know, as much as all of us here that, that are from Stewart County would like to think so, Stewart County is not the whole world. And, and, and sometimes he's going to take you out of Stewart County and put you in a place that's strange and different to see what your real priority is. But, you know, uh, the strangest thing I ever felt uh, was whenever I, uh, I, I went overseas with Brother Kenny and stepped out of the plane 
And all I could see was Russian. A language that don't even have characters like ours. And, and you know what I wanted to do? I wanted to run back in the plane and leave that place. But I found this, besides Kenny, when you're the only you literally know no one and you can't even speak the language, your relationship to the Lord becomes all important because he's the only one you know. And, and, and so we find then, as, as the Lord's people, that we certainly, uh, we certainly need to get out of that comfort zone at times and get into a place where God, where God becomes the, the, the only thing that you have. That's how you walk with God. So he makes the decision, Elisha makes the decision to leave. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord had sent me to Bethel. Now, um, I want you to see that Elijah wasn't saying, Elisha, please go with me. I want you to, I want you to go see me catch caught away. I, I want you to be have this special experience. Please go with me. No, no, he says, Elisha. You stay here, and I'm going over there. See, and, and it wasn't that he didn't like Elisha. He was testing Elisha. And God will test you too. What, what's, more comfort, uh, what's more comfortable to you, staying in Stewart County or going to Guyana? What's more comfortable to you? Staying in Stewart County or going to Paris? What's more comfortable to you? See, uh, as sovereign grace people, we don't think much about decisions, but this is a decision you've got to make. It's not accepting Christ. I don't think you'll find that in the Bible. But there is a decision to serve him. There is a decision. Are you going to go with me? Are you going to walk with me? Or are you going to stay here? And, and really the results in your life, the, the closeness that you have with the Lord and, and the fellowship you enjoy with him is really dependent if you're going to follow him or not. And so notice what Elisha says. And Elisha said unto him, as the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. But they, uh, So they went down to Bethel. Now, that is very easy to say, and I want to remind you this all happened in one day. Now, what you might not realize is from Gilgal to Bethel is 29 miles. So, it's a hot August, well, excuse me, September day. Who wants to walk to Paris with me? We'll just head out and, and, and walk down to Paris this evening, and... And I don't know, get a Coke and turn around and walk and come back. See, what we don't realize when we read these little excerpts of Scripture um, is that wasn't an easy walk. Now, if we walked over to Paris, the good thing it is, is there's a nice road all the way into Paris. has a nice wide shoulder so the cars don't... Don't, don't hit you, and all along the way is it, places you can stop and get a Coke or, or get in and out of the heat for a minute. But when they made this trip, they're in a desert area, and they're going to walk 29 miles. You know what? The way in following Christ is never pleasant to the flesh. And in fact, if somebody sells you a bill of goods and, and you feel warm and fuzzy about it, you better watch what they told you. And, and, and so we find then, as the Lord's people, that the walk with Christ can be quite difficult, and it does take a long, long time. Um, and you know when you've been walking a while, we all begin to get tired. Verse 3, And the sons of the prophets, which were at Bethel, and remember Bethel literally meaning the place of God, and the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel, came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. Now, notice uh, when they get there, 
And this group of young men come out. And I want you to notice it. A lot of people will misquote this. It doesn't say the prophets. It says the sons of the prophets. And see, this was the thing. And, and you'll find this in back in the life of Elijah that sometimes they were false priests. Remember when they were on the mountain and killed 400 prophets of Baal? That's this bunch right here. And they weren't the real deal. You, you know what I found through 25 years of ministry? And, and I'm sad to say, but I'm honest in this. There's more that you're going to find quitting than staying. You're going to find more of the prophets of Baal than you're going to find the real deal. Because, see, the real deal is difficult and hard. And it takes sticking to the stuff. And, and, and so we find them that um, they give him an easy message. Man, do you want to see somebody called away? Do, do, you want to, do you want to see somebody just disappear in front of your eyes? Uh, is that what you want to see? So they, they question him. You, you know um, what, what people questioning you about your belief causes? If you're not very careful, it causes you to question them too. Now, in one sense, that may be okay because if you can back it up with that book, go through the book and say, well, there it is. But what they were questioning Elisha about, are you sure about this thing? Are you certain? Is this what you want to do? Is this the, what, the direction that you want to go? And he says, yeah, just hold your peace. You know what hold, hold your peace means? It's a real kind way to say shut up. Just, just, just be quiet. I don't want to hear it. And, and you know, sometimes that, that's what it requires. Verse 4, thou the prophet, the main prophet, and Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he said, as the Lord liveth and as my soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. Now, I want you to see again, God's man Elijah says, you know, take it easy. Just kick back and enjoy. I'm fixing to go to Jericho. Now, uh, by the way, that's 21 more miles. So how about you walk with me to Paris? And we'll hang out for a while, and then we'll walk on over to Dresden. Because that is another 21 miles. From here to Dresden is 60 miles. And we'll just walk down there and spend the afternoon. Now, I don't know about you, but after walking 29 miles in, in the Jerusalem heat, I'd be ready to be done for the night and kick back and go to sleep and say, hey, let's get out of this heat for a while. But he says, now, Elijah, Elisha, you stay here and take it easy because I've got another walk to make. See, this is the reality. When you accomplish one thing for Christ, he's going to give you something else to do. And he says, so uh, you stay here, and I've got more things to do. And we find that Elijah says, Elisha says, no, I'm dedicated. I'm staying with you. I will not leave. As the Lord liveth and as my soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. Now, I want to, I want to interject and notice the testimony of Elijah. As my soul liveth. You know, that's the difference between the redeemed and the lost. The saved man. The saved woman, their soul liveth. See, what, what, caught, what kept Elisha going? As my soul liveth. Because, see, if it didn't, if he was a fake, he would have quit. He'd say, you know what? I'm tired. I'm weary. If you want to run down 21 miles, you go on. I'm through. But he says, no, my soul liveth. Uh, I'm the real deal. I'm with you. And... So he takes off again, and this time uh, the destination 
is Jericho. They're going to go up really close to the riverbank now and uh, to see what happens. In verse 5, and the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho, and again, notice the sons of the prophets, not the prophets themselves, that generation that was wicked, that generation that had forgotten God, and the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Tarry, I pray thee, here, for the Lord had sent me to Jordan, meaning the river. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as my soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And the two went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off, and they stood, and they too stood by Jordan. Now, if you mark in your Bible, you mark uh, verse 7, because there's where 98% of the people live. He said, and that's that 50 that stayed far off. Hey, man, we're going to watch this. I've never seen a man caught up into the sky, but I'm going to watch it from the safety of this side of Jordan. I I'm going to watch it from where everything is smooth sailing. Now, if, you know, I, I don't know much about math, but if two out of 50 was all that was willing to, to go across, and really, if you, if you get down to it, because Elijah was going to be far away, Elijah was one, the one man that said, I'll go see you. I'll, I'll go with you. I'll be beside you when it happens. If you do percentages, that's 2%. The other 98% stayed on the other side. So, if that has a biblical value, and it probably does, that means only about 2% of believers stick with the stuff. Only about 2% of believers really mean, hey, I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to stick with you. I'll cross Jordan with you, and if Jordan is high, I'll swim it with you. Very, very few people mean business with God. What, what mostly they mean is, uh, you know, if the, you know, if, if it's easy and it don't and it don't interfere with my schedule and it don't it don't interfere with me going to the park and it don't interfere with my kids' baseball schedule, then I'll serve the Lord. But Elisha was not that kind of man. He said, "Yeah, I'll go with you." Now think about this: the fifty are standing afar off. Verse eight. Then Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together, folded it in half, and he smoked the waters. And they were divided hither and thither, so the two went over on dry ground. Now, I'll show you what the Bible doesn't say. Elisha never questions God. He don't question God's man, and he don't question God. He didn't say, how are we going to get over? Now, Elijah, uh, excuse me, the Jordan River is a little... A little interesting river because sometimes when it's not in flood, you probably could go across it and do on stones like this and make it across. When it's in flood, if you swim, tried to swim in it, you'd probably drown. Swift, just unbelievable currents. So I don't know exactly, no, and the Lord don't give us that information in the scriptures, but I've often wondered, was it in flood or was it the dry season? And if it was in flood, was Elisha scared? Now, I love to swim. And when I was young, I could actually really do it. I, I, I swam across the Cumberland River at Cumberland City. And, uh, but this, this is the thing. <laughs> it wasn't in flood. And if it was in flood, you think Elijah said, and I believe this would have been recorded if it was, and Elijah says to Elijah, how are we going to get across the river? That river's in flood. What are we going to do? No. He just trusted God. He trusted God's man, and he walked on with him. 
Now, you think about this too, and I don't know how far the fifty were back, but did they see the river part? Now, and by the way, that was another five miles they had to walk. So now we're up to 65 miles, which is almost to Martin, Tennessee from here. And they, I know we can't even see the river from here. We're less than a mile from the river and we can't see it, right? So I have to assume that the special blessing of the divided river belonged only to Elisha. And why? Because he went the extra mile. In fact, he went the extra five miles. Mm -hmm. And sometimes to experience great blessings of the Lord, we have to, we have to be the individual that, that, that goes that extra mile, that goes that extra mark and say, yes, it is worth it to be with the Lord. And, and so the rivers divide and they walk across. Don't even get their feet wet. And it came to pass when they were going over, verse 9, that Elijah said unto Elisha, his tone changes, ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elijah said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. Now, I want you to see he's no longer saying, hey, stay back. Don't go with me. In other words, you know what I believe? If you stick with it and you make that determination, I'm going to serve the Lord, eventually he's going to say, hey, what can I do for you? What's your need? What's, what, what are you going to able to, what, what is your desire? And so, after they get on the side of Jordan, there's nobody saying, nobody, he's not saying, you know what, just go back. I've got something to do. He begins to ask him about blessings. You know what, have you ever been in prayer and God speak to you and, and began to ask you about your needs? And see, we always think about a loaf of bread, a gallon of cold milk, uh, pay the rent, things like that. But think about the life of Moses. He had a very similar most statement from God, and, and what was his answer? Anybody know? He says, I just want to see you. I just want to see you. And he says, you can't do that, because no man can see God and live. But go in the cleft of that rock. I'm going to put my hand, and you can look at the hundred parts. See, when you get a relationship like that with the Lord God, you're, what you see is important and necessary is going to change. You're not going to worry about the gallon of cold milk. You're going to just worry, well, what my biggest need is is faith. What my biggest need is to spend time with God. What my biggest need is is to have a closer walk today than I did yesterday. That is my biggest need. Not, not a Coca-Cola or anything like that. What I need to do is spend time with God. And, and, and so we find that he says, I just, want, I, I just want to enjoy the spirit that you've enjoyed. Verse 10. And he said, meaning Elijah, verse 10, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. For, but, it, it, but if not, it shall not be so. And as, they, and as it came to pass, they still went on. Now, he says, Elisha, what do you want? And he says, I want a double portion of your spirit. And he says, you've asked a hard thing. But if you see me go, you'll get it. And you know what happened? He didn't go right there. Did he? And not to be critical, but I will say this before I make this statement. No one knows the day or the hour of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And I've heard since I was that high, people, oh, he's coming in 88. He's coming in blah, blah. You know what? I didn't have no sense about the Bible then to come in out of the rain. I knew that wasn't true because nobody knows. Right? And I say that to say this. <laughs> what I'm going to do is keep coming, keep going to get here. You know, it's really immaterial when he comes because we've been given commission 
And that is spread the glorious gospel of Christ till he does come, right? And, and nothing has ever changed about that, so why don't we just keep doing that? Do what he's told us to do and keep going. So after he makes this statement, uh, Elijah, may, uh, Elijah may have been excited and said, hey, but they still had to walk on. They still went a little further. And I don't know how far on the east side of Jordan that they went, but I know they walked a ways. Could be 70 miles by now. That would have been five more miles. So now we're in Martin, Tennessee. From here to Martin, to the college, is 70 miles. You want to walk to Martin in the night? You see, if you want a closeness like Enoch had, and like Elisha had with Elijah, it's going to take something. It's going to take something that most of us don't have. You know, we are such a baby people in the United States. We are spoiled rotten and don't even know it. You, you get out of this country and, and you'll find that. When I went to the old Soviet Union, I'd never been so hungry in all my life. I lost five pounds the first week I was there. What we call saucer, that's their, that's their supper plate. And um, as a spoiled people, we don't understand what we want, do we? We really don't. And we certainly don't understand needs. A need is so different than a want. And, and, and so we find then that sometimes you're going to be asked to go a little further. You're going to ask to be asked to walk that 70 mile dry, dusty trip in order to have a closeness with God that you've never, ever experienced before. In fact, that's what fasting uh, is all about. And so uh, in verse, uh, the rest of verse 11, and taught that, and, and taught that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder or apart and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Now, no, don't ever let anybody tell you that uh, Elijah took the chariot to heaven because it doesn't say that. said that he went up by a whirlwind or a tornado or a little cyclone. All the, all the chariot did was, was divide them apart. You know what? It, it, it takes a pretty powerful thing to divide people sometimes. Um, now he's going to be alone. And so he, he, he says, my God, my God, the chariot of Israel and the fire thereof. And, and he's taken aback by what he saw, sees, and he sees his master go away from him. And then a little something's starting to fall back. And that's the mantle of Elijah. Right. And he grabs it up. No doubt he looks at it a minute. And he, walk, he walks back to the river. Again, I don't know if it's five miles or two miles or a mile. And he says, show me the God of Elijah. And that thing split, split back open, and he lived a different life from that day forward. <laughs> and you know what? He got his double portion. <laughs> Elijah, Elijah raised one from the dead, and Elijah raised two. See, sometimes we have to go through some things to experience that sweetness with Christ. Um, wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if all they said of you when they put you out here beside the church building is that she walked with God. She was a witness to me. She was a blessing. I've often thought about that. This shows how, shows how stupid you are when you're young. When I, when I, when I graduated from Martin and, and passed my licensure, Man, uh, when I wrote my name, I put R in as big as I could write it on the end. Um, you know what? When I die, I'm going to have Larry Lafferty comma R in put on my headstone. Isn't that foolish? I, re I really thought about it. I wouldn't tell nobody but Donna. She told me that was stupid then. <laughs> uh, uh, but I don't want to necessarily be remembered as a nurse. I'm okay. I, I love nursing still. 
But I don't want anybody to say Larry was a good nurse. I would much rather say Larry walked with God. That's all can be said about him. What about you? Yeah. What about you? And uh, we <laughs> we need that, don't we? But listen, it's going to cost you something. Yeah. And you can't make that claim and you can't make that testimony halfway do it. Because you know what? People are going to see it. People are going to understand. What's, what's the most important thing to you? Uh, I look at my grandbabies and I've always heard this and I, I would chuckle a little bit and, and move on. But uh, I wish I could have had my grandbabies first. Well, I, I, I'm there now. But as sweet and precious as my grandchildren are, the Lord has to come first. Man. Has to come first. As sweet as your children are and as much as you love them, He has to come first. Whatever your career is, whatever you do for a living, really doesn't matter, does it? He's got to come first. If you want to be that way, if you want to be an Elisha, excuse me, an Enoch, an Elisha, he's got to come first.